you guys can have a seat. So as you can tell by the title of this message, it is called Don't Quit. And it seems pretty self-explanatory, right? Like, point taken. Just from the title alone, I could come up here and be like, hey, don't quit. Drop the mic, walk off the stage, send you home early. But there's more to it than that. Whatever pain you're facing, whatever challenge you're enduring, what we're going to see is that Jesus understands. He's been there. But first, before we do anything else, I want to encourage you that in whatever challenge, whatever pain that you're in, don't quit. All right, you got this. It's going to be okay. Because how many of us would just love to have a life of pain? We love heartache when it comes. We love asking questions about life. Like, you just love it. Nobody. Right? Of course not. But here lies the problem. Nobody likes pain. Nobody likes when things are hard. Nobody likes when life gets tough. But here's the thing. Anything worth doing is going to be hard. Anything worth doing is going to be hard. And what we do a lot of times is we find this out the hard way. We face opposition. Things get hard. Challenges come. And we find ourselves wanting to quit. Ready to just throw in the towel and be done with it. And we tell ourselves, like, what's the big deal if I quit? What does it matter? Nobody's going to notice. But here's what it matters. You can never get to the end product of what you want if you don't go through the process of pain. You'll never be what you want to be. You'll never get to where you want to get to if you don't endure the pain that comes because anything worth doing is going to be hard. You want to be a, a champion in your sport, it's going to be hard. You want to be a leader in your school, it's going to be hard. You want to be a person of character, hard. You want to be a great musician, a great dancer, a great athlete, hard. You want to have a great marriage one day, start a business, start a family, it's going to be hard. You want to be a follower of Christ, it's going to be hard. And in order to endure, you've got to find something deep in you not to quit. You've got to find your motivation. Because this is our main point of tonight. If quitting is in your vocabulary, then quitting is in your future. Don't even let quitting be an option for you in anything that you do. Endure to the end. Because Jesus didn't quit. He understands the desire to want to quit, but he never quit. He lasted until he could say, it's finished. The first verse I want us to look at tonight, and there's going to be a lot, so I apologize in advance, but they're on the screen. Do your best to keep up. The first one I want us to look at comes from Mark 14, verse 36. It's Jesus' prayer. And he says this, Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Do you feel the tension in that prayer? Please take this cup of suffering away from me. But in order to really appreciate, to really understand this, we've got to go back further in this story. So we're going to go back all the way to the Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples are having dinner. They're celebrating the Passover. And then in the middle of this dinner party, Jesus stands up and he says this. He says, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. And you could hear a pin drop, right? This is a party, everybody's celebrating. And then Jesus gets up and says, tonight, every single one of you are going to abandon me. It's like, what? Like, dude just drops it out of nowhere. And then Peter stands up, and Peter says, even if they all fall away on account of you, I never will. And so now Peter just made it even more awkward for everybody there. All the disciples sitting around like, hey, I appreciate that, Peter. Right? Because he says, even if they all leave you, I won't. I got your back because I'm Peter. Right? Just threw every other disciple under the bus. And Jesus responds with this. Truly, I tell you. 
this very night before the rooster crows, you, Peter, will disown me three times. Peter doesn't quit, though. Peter doubles down. Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. So why is Peter so adamant about this? Why is he so like, ah, I'm not going to leave you? Well, to understand that, we've got to go further back. We go back to chapter 16. All of that was from Matthew 26. So go back 10 chapters to Matthew 16. And there was a moment in chapter 16 when all the disciples were together. They're with Jesus, and he's asking them who the people say that he is. And then he just, again, just drops it on Peter and says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And this is one of those questions like that you have in school that like you think you know the answer to. And everybody thinks they know the answer to it, but nobody wants to answer it because like you don't want to be the one that gets it wrong. And so Peter's sitting there like, I know this all the time. They're like, yeah, we know this, but like I don't want to be the one to answer it because I don't want to upset Jesus. But he goes, Peter gets called out. Who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of of the living God. Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And so in that moment, that's when he changes his name from Simon to Peter. And this is really significant. We're going to come back to it at the end. He changes his name from Simon to Peter and says, And on this rock I will build my church. So Peter's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I got it right. Y'all hear that? I'm the rock now. Jesus is going to build his church on me. I ain't Simon no more. I'm Peter. And so that's why he's so adamant when Jesus said, you're all going to fall away. And Peter's like, no, nah, no, nah. You forget who you're talking to. I'm the rock. I got this. I am not going anywhere. And so flashback, they're back at the Last Supper after Peter and Jesus have had this conversation. And it says they went out to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And in this, it says Jesus is overwhelmed at this time. Right? He's overwhelmed with heartache, with struggle, because he knows what's coming. And so he takes a smaller group, and they split off from the other disciples. He gets Peter, James, and John. And so those four walk off, and he says this to them. We're in Mark 14. It says, they went to the olive grove, a grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. It says he was overwhelmed to the point of death. Right? Records also tell us that he was sweating blood. He was so overcome with stress and with anxiety, just struggling with what he knew was coming. And so you can feel the intensity of his struggle. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And so he says, Peter, James, John, sit here and keep watch. I'm going to pray. And so... When he says that, we're back to our first scripture, right? That first prayer that we read. After all this, now we read it with a little bit different perspective. This prayer that he's crying out in this moment, sweating blood, soul crushed to the point of death. He says, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering from me. I don't want it. I want to quit. I'm done. But he finishes with this, I want your will to be done, not mine. After he finishes his prayer, he gets up, goes back over Peter, James, and John. They're asleep. And you know when he came back and he found them asleep, you can just feel his desire to want to quit. Right? These guys, these leaders, the rock is sleeping. It says he returned with his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, don't miss that. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? 
Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? And then again, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. A couple things to just pull from this. Right? Notice something. Mark, who wrote Mark, points this out. He says, Simon, he said to Peter. He changed his name to Peter, but yet he comes back in this moment and calls him Simon. He's reminding him that he's supposed to be the rock. But he's not acting like the rock in this moment. Sleeping like a rock, maybe, but he's not acting like the rock. He had just had this big, I'll never leave you even if they all do. I'll fight for you. I'll die for you. I can't stay away from you, though. And Jesus says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you ever felt that? That the flesh is weak. I can't go on. My spirit really wants to. I really want to be better. I really want to be able to fix this. I really want to be able to change this. I really want to be able to fill in the blank with whatever it is for you. But the flesh is weak. And you just want to quit. Jesus has been there. Knowing everything that is coming. His leaders are sleeping on the job. He goes and he prays some more. Comes back a second time. Somebody forgot to hit the snooze again because they're asleep. He wakes them up. And he goes to pray a third time. He comes back a third time. And Mark 14 says, when he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But know the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. So this time he comes back. They're asleep. He's like, all right, guys. You've had your rest. The son of man is about to be betrayed. My betrayer is at hand. And it says that as they left the garden, immediately soldiers come to arrest Jesus. One of them puts their hands on Jesus, tries to arrest him. Peter pulls out his sword, cuts the guy's ear off. And Jesus turns around and looks at Peter. And he's like, stop. John 18, 11 says, but Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the father has given me? So Peter just can't catch a break. But before we throw stones at Peter and we start talking about how bad Peter is, Imagine what's going through his mind in this moment. Right? You know Peter's thinking to himself, man, you're supposed to be a leader. You got your name changed. You're supposed to be the rock. You go a bit too hard at the dinner party and stand up and say, they might all leave you, but I'm not. I'll stand by you. I'm here with you. But then I can't even stay awake and keep watch. Think about how bad he must have felt. Right? How ridiculous of me to say that I'll die for you, but then I fall asleep. And so Peter's frustrated. He's groggy. He just woke up. And he's mad. He's trying to prove he's the rock. Now here come the guards. They're going to take Jesus away. And he's like, nah, bro. It takes out the sword. I'm going to prove I'm the rock. Cuts the guy's ear off. Only for Jesus to turn around and rebuke him again. Right? Peter can't win. He's got to be like, all right, that's it. This is terrible. I'm horrible. I'm done. And in this moment, the disciples scatter. They're gone. And Jesus is alone in the garden with these guards being taken to trial. And still, he looks at Peter and says, shall I not drink from the cup of suffering my father has given me? Do you feel that resolve to not quit? I will drink from the cup that God has given me. I will not quit. Why wouldn't he quit? He had every reason to quit at this point. But why? He knew there was no other way. There was no other way. Because he had already prayed to God and asked for it. He prayed, God, if there's any other way, let's do that. Please, if there's any other way than this. But yet he still said, I will not quit. Not my will, 
for yours. If quitting is in your vocabulary, quitting is in your future. And Jesus never quit. And so they take Jesus to trial. All the disciples have scattered. But Peter follows along behind. And I imagine he's kind of just like ducking in and out of bushes, like trying to stay at a distance, trying to see and hear what's going on, but also not wanting to be seen, like keeping his distance. I don't know where I stand with Jesus right now. He just yelled at me again like four times in one night. We're not like, I don't know. So Peter's following along, kind of staying low key, still trying to see what's going on. But the thing about it is it gets cold at night. So he got cold. He walks over. Warm himself up by a fire. He's standing around. And somebody notices him. They said, hey, weren't you with him? Talking about Jesus. Weren't you with him? Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never met that man before. They said, no, you're with him. I know you were. I've seen you with him. Peter says, I don't know that guy, okay? I'm not with him. Some time passes another person. No, I know you were with him. Peter says, I'm telling you, I don't know who that man is. And Luke 22 says that when he said this, the Lord's eyes and Peter's eyes connected and the rooster crowed. He had denied Jesus three times. And it says Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Peter was ready to quit. And so what are you ready to quit on? Are you ready to quit on school? Does it feel like, man, I just can't get ahead. I can't win. So you're just ready to stop trying. Or maybe it's your, your hobbies, your sports, something that you love. And man, it's been hard. There's been struggles. And you're just ready to quit because it'd be easier to. Or maybe it's your friends or your family and things aren't great. And sometimes you feel like it'd be easier to just quit and just isolate yourself. Or maybe you're just ready to quit on God. Because maybe you've been praying for something and the answer God gave you wasn't the one you wanted. Or maybe you feel like you've been praying and there's just been no answer. You feel like you're just waiting and waiting. and Maybe you're ready to quit on God. Or maybe you're like Peter and you're just ready to quit on yourself. We hate pain. We hate discomfort. We hate challenges. And often it makes us want to quit. Let me tell you, what if it's the very discomfort that we feel that shapes us into who God wants us to be? What if all that pain is just making us more like Christ? What if all that suffering is just teaching us how to be more like him? What if it's the very discomfort that we feel that shapes us into who God wants us to be? So I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that God doesn't quit on us. Because Jesus has been there. He knows what it's like to want to quit. But he didn't. He didn't quit. Think about all that he went through in this, just this moment. Right? The extreme sense of loss that he felt, but he didn't quit. He was falsely accused, but didn't quit. The abandonment he went through, everybody he loved most had left him, and he didn't quit. Physical pain that was unbearable, unimaginable, and didn't quit. The humiliation of being stripped bare as creation mocked their creator, and he still did not quit. And all of this ultimately culminating in Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross to save us from our own depravity, he did not quit. He knew that he was the only way, and so quitting was never in his vocabulary from the jump. He loved the disciples too much to quit. He loved Peter too much to quit. And guys, he loved you too much to quit. He loved you too much to quit. He endured the pain and the suffering until, as recorded in John 19, he exclaims in a loud voice from the cross, it is finished. 
He went through all of it until he could say, it is finished. He just would not quit. We talked about finding that motivation within you to not quit. Jesus had his motivation, and guess what it was? It was you sitting in this room right now. He knew before you were ever born, before you had ever done anything in your life, good, bad, ugly, he didn't care. He saw you in this very moment and said, I love you too much to quit. So what about Peter? What's he doing now? Last time we saw Peter, he was weeping. Well, a few things have happened since we last saw Peter, right? Peter, actually, pretty cool, he got to witness the empty tomb, right? After Jesus was buried and resurrected, he saw the empty tomb. Peter was also with the disciples meeting in the upper room when Jesus appeared to him, right? Jesus appears behind locked doors, hangs out for a moment, disappears again, like, sick party trick, like, it was awesome. So Peter got to witness that. But perhaps the most important moment that we see from Peter is found in John 21, and I'm going to tell you how it happened. A few of the disciples are on the shore on the Sea of Galilee. Why the Sea of Galilee? Well, think about who Peter was. See, the Sea of Galilee is where it all started for Peter. Because before he was a disciple, he was a fisherman. Right in Matthew 4, when Peter is called, he's fishing. And Jesus calls him to follow him. And so maybe Peter just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going fishing. Is he quitting? Who knows? But he's certainly not preaching about Jesus anymore. He had seen the empty tomb. He saw the resurrected Jesus. So I don't believe personally that he was quitting on his faith, but I think maybe he was ready to quit on himself and just go back to fishing. Because maybe he just feels unworthy. Right? Think about it. I fell asleep when I was asked to keep watch. I cut off the guard's ear and that was wrong too. I denied Jesus three times. I'm not the rock. I'm a fisherman. So Peter and these disciples, they fish all night, catch nothing. Next morning, somebody from the shore yells out, Hey, you guys caught anything? And they're like, uh, No. They couldn't see that it was Jesus at this point. And so this man from the shore that we know is Jesus says, Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. They do it because why not? They ain't caught nothing. Why not try the other side of the boat? Nets are full. And it was in this moment when they saw this miracle, John says to Peter, it's the Lord, right? It's Jesus. And Peter jumps into the water, starts swimming, heads straight to shore. Scripture tells us Jesus already there, the fire going, there's fish roasting. And Peter and the other disciples get back. In this moment, honestly, it feels a little bit awkward, right? Because here's Peter, the same Peter that said, I'll never deny you. I'm with you until death, unlike these other guys. If I'm one of those other disciples that Peter just like threw under the bus back then, and I know all the ways Peter's failed, I'm ready to see Jesus let Peter have it, right? This dude fell asleep, cut the guy's ear off, denied you, let him have it, Jesus. And so they're all just kind of sitting there like, what is going to happen? Is this the end of the journey for Peter? Is Jesus going to accept Peter back? Is he going to forgive Peter? Can he use a failure like Peter? What was Jesus going to say? And so everybody's kind of just sitting there feeling out what is Jesus going to say. And so finally Jesus looks over the fire and he asks a question. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Ow, right? Notice what he calls him there. He refers to him as Simon. But also recognize that Jesus is reminding him of that whole, I won't leave you even if they all do speech Peter gave. He says, do you love me more than these? And the word for love Jesus used here is agape. And agape is sacrificial, faithful love, an act of the will. 
right? Something that really only God and Jesus understand. And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But the word for love that Peter responds with is phileo. And phileo is a brotherly love, right? It's tight. It's that bond. But it's just a close brotherly friendship. So it's a different kind of love. Jesus repeated the question to him again. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Forget the others this time. Do you love me? Again, Jesus is using agape. And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He's still using phileo, that brotherly love. And a third time. Jesus asked him, Simon, do you love me? And this time, Jesus pulls it down to where Peter is. And he uses the word phileo. And Peter replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love, that I phileo you. Jesus met Peter where he was. Peter had denied Jesus three times. But then Jesus forgave him three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the thing about it is Jesus forgave. And I'll be real honest. Some Christians, we have a message of forgiveness for the unbeliever. You can be forgiven. You can be saved. But no message of forgiveness for Christians, for believers. Some of us, like some of these disciples, had to have been was like, Peter, dude, you screwed up. You're done. And sometimes we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ and we're like, you're done. You messed up. But I'm so thankful that we serve a God who has enough forgiveness for the unbeliever and the believer. That he doesn't quit on us. And so Jesus tells Peter in this moment, it's going to be hard. But I want you to continue to follow me. Don't give up. Don't quit. See, Jesus wasn't wrong when he called Peter the rock way back then. Peter had just had to go through some pain in order to become the rock. And so after this, Peter doesn't quit. In fact, he was the preacher of, of Pentecost, right? And if you know Pentecost, this is where Peter delivers one of the most transformative messages of like all time, right? It says 3,000 people were saved that day. And so what you see is that on the other side of that pain, on the other side of that heartbreak, on the other side of that failure, there is a Pentecost waiting for you. On the other side of Peter's greatest failures, the things he never thought he could come back from, he had one of the greatest moments for the kingdom of heaven. 3,000 people were saved. All because he didn't quit. And so when you feel ready to quit, Remind yourself that on the other side of that pain, there's something incredible that God's waiting to do in you and through you if you don't quit. So don't quit. You want to be a leader in your school? Don't quit. You want to stop praying for that person in your life? Don't quit. You're having a hard time forgiving? Don't quit. You can't feel God speaking to you when you pray? Well, don't quit. You're experiencing loss and heartbreak and suffering. Don't quit. You want to lead a life worthy of your calling. Don't quit. You want to be a follower of Christ. Well, don't quit. Because if quitting is in your vocabulary, then quitting is in your future. So in your weariness, know that Jesus has been there. He knows what it feels like to want to quit. But he persevered until he could say, it is finished. And so I pray that God would just give you the strength in your weakness to know to lean on his strength so that you never quit. And that you believe that on the other side of that pain, there is a Pentecost. There is a miracle waiting to happen. And so here in this moment, during this time of prayer, this time of worship, you respond however the Lord is leading you to. If you need to pray, because maybe there's been times in your life where you've been ready to quit. Maybe you've quit on yourself or on somebody or on something already. And you're just kind of here going through the motions. You came with a friend. You're just here because people expect you to be. 
that you've quit, you've checked out. Use this time to recommit to God. To say, God, I understand Jesus wanted to quit, but he didn't. And he didn't for me. And so if he can go through that and not quit, give me the strength to go through these challenges I'm facing and not quit. Or maybe you're just at that decision point right here, that crossroads, where there's struggles, there's trials that you're facing in your life right now. And maybe you haven't made the decision to quit, to give up, but you're right there. Pray that God would strengthen you, that he would sustain you every single day to continue to fight, to continue to look to him and rely on him, to be desperate and dependent on him to show up in your life every single day. Wherever you're at, however the Lord is leading you, my hope and my prayer is that you will respond however the Lord leads you at this time. Whether it's by yourself, up here at the altar, with a group of friends, with a leader, you respond however the Lord leads. We're here for you. We're here to talk with you. We're here to encourage you not to quit. But ultimately, God is the only one that can sustain you and give you the strength to keep going. So as this song plays, you respond. Go ahead, Brandon. Thank you. 